Welcome to this broadcast from Money Hill Church in South Birmingham. My name is Phil Sweeting. I'm one of the ministers of the church. Uh, today is the third Sunday of Advent and we're going to continue to explore the, the meaning of or the, the reason for Christ's coming, his birth on this earth. Uh, and we're going to do that by reflecting on one of the more I suppose obscure Old Testament uh, passages, certainly one of the more unusual stories from the Old Testament, and uh, an often overlooked little phrase in the New Testament uh, to help us reflect on why Jesus came. But before we do any of that, we're going to start by singing uh, a great Christmas carol, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. This time of Advent is a time of expectancy and waiting. And as such, it's a time to exercise faith. The, the birth of Jesus, we know, is such revolutionary, revolutionary and, and, and world-changing news. And yet, as we look around us, 
we see the ongoing challenges of a world torn apart by uh, viruses, by, by human selfishness and greed. In our nation, uh, at least, uh, the places are not true, but in our nation, the, the progress of the gospel seems slow, even though it's such good news. The church often seems weak and ineffective. And uh, at these times, we would do well to reflect on God's sufficiency in our weakness. Scotty Smith, the American pastor, had a wonderful prayer this week, which focused on the gulf between what we can see and imagine and, and the faithfulness of God's promises. And so we're going to start our time of prayer by using that prayer and, and some words of Mary and of the angel when the birth of Jesus was foretold. So let's pray together. <clears throat> How will this be? Mary asked the angel. And the angel answered, no word from God will ever fail. And Mary answered, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Heavenly Father, the one thing we share in common with Mary is awe laced with unbelief over the breathtaking, hope pregnant promises you've made about Jesus. We too say, how will this be? And we hear you answer back from the scriptures, nothing is impossible with God. No word from God will ever fail. Everything you've promised with regard to Jesus will come to pass, though in an entirely different way, as surely as you place Jesus in Mary, you've done the same for us. Christ in us is our sure and our only hope of glory, and Christ is being formed in us. One day we will be Jesus lookalikes and loverlikes. One day the entire earth will be filled with your glory. Thank you, Father. This is really good news every year, but especially in 2020. For the rest of Advent through Christmas, may we encourage each other, and all the more as we see this quintessentially glorious day approaching. So we pray in Jesus' exalted and powerful name. Loving Father, we pray that in the light of your promises, we might continue to hold out hope in these difficult days. We've already sung of peace on earth and good will to men, but our current reality seems so different to that. The sorrow brought by sin and strife lingers on. There are divisions within and between nations, injustice and exploitation on every side. Help us to hear your voice in the midst of it all. Help us to be your hands and to seek justice and to do good where we are able. Lift our eyes beyond our own concerns and needs to the needs of those around us, we pray. The message of the gospel is more important and relevant this Christmas than ever before. And so we pray that many might hear and believe. Give us courage and boldness in our individual contexts to live for, speak of and honour you. May our church family be so shaped by your love and grace that it becomes a transformational community which provokes and points a watching world to you. We pray for our own nation as a Covid vaccine begins to roll out and as our final departure from Europe draws closer. Give great wisdom and courage to our leaders, nationally and locally, to take those steps which are necessary for the flourishing of all and especially for the good of those who are most vulnerable. As we pray for our leaders, we pray too for ourselves that in our own limited spheres of influence, we might be a blessing to others. We pray for frontline workers, whether they be in the medical or caring professions, the teaching professions or anywhere else, that you would grant grace and stamina and peace. And we pray that you might be gracious to us and continue to shape us more into the likeness of your Son. Day by day we're reminded of our own sin and our own failings, failings of love, failings of patience, failings of wisdom. 
as we come to your word again tonight. We pray that you would be working by your spirit and continuing that slow process of transformation. Help us to believe that your promises are true and that your spirit is at work. And may we see the fruit of that work in our lives. We pray all these things desperately aware of our dependence on you and in the precious name of your Son. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Once I heard a sermon on the question, where is heaven? And the answer given basically was up, which is OK as far as it goes. But it's not literally true, is it? Uh, we know that when the SpaceX crew and their very rich guests finally leave our atmosphere, they don't come eventually to the realm where God dwells. Heaven is separated from us by more than simply space and distance in space. But it is a helpful metaphor to say heaven is up. And in the Bible, we often see that kind of uh, spatial language used to try and help us to understand this fundamental idea that whether we're thinking sort of spatially, whether we're thinking in terms of glory or power or wisdom, God is above us and greater than us in every way. The prophet Isaiah saw this perhaps more clearly than anyone else in the Old Testament. So he writes in Isaiah 40, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the world, uh, the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the canopy, the heavens like a canopy, spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of the world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, then he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who, who created all these? He brings out the starry host one by one and calls them forth, uh, each one of them by name. Because of his great power and might, mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Get the picture? God is great. He's so much greater than us. We're, we're like little grasshoppers to him. A little later on, he says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's humbling language when we truly understand it. The Psalms often use the same kind of language, uh, though wonderfully uh, they remind us that, amongst other things, he outdoes us in love as much as in anything else. So Psalm 103 verse 11, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. <clears throat> but let's just stick with that spatial metaphor for the time being because I want to make the obvious point tonight that if God wants to reveal himself to us or, or make himself known then he must stoop that's why I've called today's message the God who stoops it's, it's like if I wanted to talk to an ant I've got to get down on my knees I also need to learn ant language which would be a bit of a problem for me but you see the point God must stoop to reach us there's a great Bible story that, that humorously makes this point back in Genesis 11. At that time, uh, the people of the earth all spoke one language and their intent on making a name for themselves, showing how great they are. They build a city and, and, and they have delusions of grandeur and want to build this massive tower so high that it reaches up into the heavens, into God's realm. And we read in Genesis 11 and verse 5 that the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the people were making. It's like the ultimate put down. That tower that you think is so high, I can't even see it from up here. 
it's not even on my radar. I, I need to come right down to your level if it's even going to register. It's Isaiah 55, 9 again, isn't it? As far as the, as, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. But the one thing that we do know about the God of the Bible is that he longs for relationship with his people. He longs to make himself known to the people he has made. He's pleased to stoop down to make himself known. And of course, that's right at the heart of what is going on on that first Christmas. But to set the scene uh, for what we're thinking about this evening, we're going to have a reading now from one of the more unusual incidents in the Old Testament. It's from Genesis 28. Genesis 28 verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of the Lord were ascending and descending it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All people on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed into his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. It's a slightly odd story, isn't it? We're not going to dwell long in Genesis 28 because I want to look at the way that Jesus fulfills this story. But it will enrich our time if we notice just a few things. First of all, it's really important to remember the setting of the story. Trickster Jacob has just swindled his brother out of his inheritance and his birthright. Of course, that was something that God had actually promised him. He'd promised that, that Jacob would become first. But rather than trusting God and waiting for that to be fulfilled, he took matters into his own hands. And he resorted to deceit and trickery. And now he's on the run. His brother Esau is understandably angry. In fact, he's planning to kill him. So their mother uh, says to Jacob, it's time for you to flee until the dust settles, until he calms down. And it's this fugitive on the run in the middle of nowhere that, that God graciously reveals himself to. He has this vision. He sees a stairway, a ladder. Uh, reaching from the earth up to, to heaven. I'm desperately trying to avoid uh, mentioning any song lyrics at this point. <clears throat> His vision is of angels going up and down and doing the will of God and intervening in human affairs. In some senses he even gets a glimpse of God himself. Uh, and then wonder of wonders, God speaks. He speaks words of blessing, words of promise. The promises that were first given to his grandfather Abraham are now reaffirmed and he's given the wonderful promise of God's presence with him. It's a remarkable moment. It changes the whole nature of Jacob's life. But notice, this is really important, the staggering grace that's involved in all of this. It's wonderfully captured by Pastor Kent Hughes. Let me read what he says, fellow believers, this is all grace. Jacob, the conniving believer who was outcast and alone due to his own sin, who merited nothing from God, was met by God in his misery with an unparalleled revelation of God's care and assurance for the future. 
Jacob was not seeking God. He was fleeing the consequences of his deception. He was not expecting grace. But grace was unleashed upon his soul. And with not even a word of reproach, the vision and the voice of God only bore assurances. I think he's absolutely right. And there's a word of encouragement there for all of us. Because we're all Jacobs in, in our own way. We're all running away because of our sin. We're all imagining God is not with us, not interested in us because of our sin. But in reality, God has made wonderful promises to be with his people through thick and thin. Our unfaithfulness cannot undo his faithfulness. Praise God. There's a connecting ladder between heaven and earth, so, so we are never alone. And his attitude towards us is always one of grace. Hold on to that vision in your minds when you're struggling or, or when God feels far away. But it's the nature of that connecting ladder that I want us to sort of dwell on, reflect on tonight. And that's where we're going to turn to an often overlooked phrase in John's Gospel. Let's listen to the whole passage to put the phrase into its context. Uh, one of our young people, Heidi, is now going to read for us John 1. 43 to 51. This reading comes from John chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were stood under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you, I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. This too is a really curious little passage. When I've preached on it in the past, I've focused on the attitude of Philip, who is so excited about having met Jesus that he wants to introduce him to all his friends. In fact, in Philip's sort of heart and actions, there is, is the heart of evangelism, it's sort of in a nutshell. I found someone wonderful and I want you to meet him too. That is a useful sermon, I hope, that could be preached on that. But it's the last two verses that I want us to focus on tonight. Verses that I've often really skimmed over in the past. Jesus is speaking to Nathaniel, who is amazed that Jesus seems to know who he is and where he's been. But Jesus says, you will see greater things than these. And he adds in verse 51, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I hope you immediately hear the, the illusion, the echo of our earlier reading. This is an illusion to Jacob's ladder. So Jesus is saying, amongst other things, that he himself is the connecting point between heaven and earth. He's the connection, the place of meeting. Or, to borrow Jacob's terms, Jesus is the gate of heaven. That's our first point tonight. Jesus is the gate of heaven. Whatever else is going on here, and I think we'll see it's not straightforward, Jesus is self-consciously identifying himself with, with that vision that was given to Jacob. We started off this evening reminding ourselves of the vast gulf that lies between God and us, that separates us. And we've reminded ourselves that we have a God who stoops. And, and Jesus is the most amazing way in which that stooping, uh, that connection 
happens, takes place. I think some of the little differences between the scenes are instructive. So Jesus says, you will see heaven open in, in our NIVs. More literally, you will see heaven open opened it's it's a it's a past tense a finished thing so unlike the going up and down of the angels which is a present tense which is sort of a continuous action that's always going on the verb form for opened is a perfect tense which is a a completed action and so i don't think it's pushing the text too far to say that jesus is referring to the fact that 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 in his work on the cross he he will permanently open the way back to god the curtain is torn in two. The barrier is down. Jacob got a sort of a, a fleeting vision of a, a sort of an entrance then. But, but Jesus saying, no, I, I'm going to make a way forever. Once and for all. He stooped. He, he came down to earth specifically for this purpose. To, to open up that way. Remember Jacob's reaction to his vision. He realised that God was in this place and he, he set up a pillar. It was almost like a sort of a proto-temple, a, 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 a prefiguring of the temple. And as the Old Testament carries on, we see there are various places of meeting with God. The next one will be the tabernacle, which is sort of a portable temple tent. And then, of course, later the temple itself is built by King Solomon. Well, if you read through John's Gospel, from which our reading is taken, we see this idea developed that Jesus is the true temple. That the true place where God is and, and meets with us. So when a Samaritan woman, a chapter or two later, asks Jesus where to worship, he, he says in effect, well the place doesn't matter. God is looking for worshippers in spirit and truth. Worshippers who come to the Father through Jesus. So Jesus is the gate of heaven. That's why he came, to open up the way. For all who would want to get to know God, you need to come to Jesus and find in him an open way to God. But what does it mean uh, to say you'll see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man? Well, the honest answer is, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I've tried to think about it this week. Um, s some, some think uh, I want to sort of tie this phrase to, to a specific event in Nathaniel's life, so something that he will actually see. And if, if that's the correct approach, then the most likely reference is to Jesus' uh, ascension. You know, when he returns after after his resurrection, he spent time with his belief, with his followers, and then he he he's ascends he, he lifts up into the heavens to return to God again and they say if you run with that argument that the heavens were opened and the angels sort of came up and down to, to minister to Jesus as he ascended in all honesty I find that approach implausible that seems quite an odd and strange reading for me and I can't find any other events in the gospel that fit that imagery any better so maybe it's not referring to a specific event so or, or not one that's already happened. So some people tie it to an event that's going to happen. Like they note that Jesus uses his one of his favourite names for himself, the, the Son of Man, uh, which is, uh, amongst other things, an allusion to Daniel 7, uh, 13 and 14. And, and so they say it may be that the ascending and descending of the angels alludes to their ministering to, to this son of man in his glory so they say this is referring to jesus return when he comes back with the angels in his glory so so this could be a reference to his second coming but again it's not at all obvious to me why the angels would be literally ascending and descending on the son of man the, the language is quite specific it doesn't seem to make sense to me so I think the most helpful way to read this is simply to, to see here an allusion to Jacob's ladder. And the main point of contact then is, is the one we've already made, the, the, the idea of access to heaven. Excuse me. In other words, we, we may not need to push the details any further than that. The reality is that, that Christ is the gate of heaven, uh, that, 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 that 
that has opened up and 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 this reality is permanently true that there's now a way between heaven and earth it seems to me of anything the ascending and descending of angels in in jacob's vision and so also in jesus words are just a hint that there's there's two-way traffic between heaven and earth it, it speaks perhaps instead of god's direct interest in and involvement in the events on earth for our part we can only receive these benefits uh, in christ christ is the one who mediates that relationship for us i wouldn't go to the stake on this uh, but it does look like i'm with calvin on this one and he was much smarter than me so maybe you'll trust him but i think there are still uh, broader points that we can see here and, and make from the, the parallel with Jacob's vision. Because what Jacob received at Bethel was a revelation of God and, and a revelation from God. He sort of saw God and he heard from God. And so as Jesus applies this vision to himself, we can say, I think, Jesus is the final revelation of God. Jesus is the final revelation of God. That's my second point this evening. I think we're on pretty safe uh, ground in the New Testament here, don't you? Think think of Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 4. In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, including this ladder of course. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. In other words, Jesus is the final and perfect revelation of God. In the past, God gave, uh, uh, gave and used visions like this one that we've been thinking about that was given to Jacob. But now he's spoken in and through his son. And that's a big theme in the Gospel of John. Show us the Father, says Philip in John 14, 8, and that will be enough for us. Well, listen to Jesus' reply. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Or what about those magnificent and spine-tingling words with which the Gospel opens, which we often hear at Christmas actually. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, without him nothing has been made Nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And a few verses later, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the God who stoops, who dwells among us, who literally tabernacles amongst us, becoming the true access point to heaven and revealing God to us. Perhaps these are the greater things that Nathaniel will see. He's already acknowledged that Jesus is the Son of God, the King of Israel, but he really doesn't know yet what that means. That Jesus will become the gate to heaven, that, that Jesus will become the final revelation of God. Well, in this season of Advent, these are very helpful images to reflect on. We have a God who stoops to make himself known, who in the person of Jesus takes on the humiliation of human flesh so that he might become the gate of heaven and so that he might make God known in a complete and final way. That's what we're celebrating when we look at that baby in the manger, the God who stoops. And that has several implications for us. 
perhaps the, the key and most important message of Christmas is that God actively pursues a relationship with us. He's prepared to stoop to identify with us, to do all that is necessary to open up the way in Christ, to humble himself, even to death on a cross, to take on our sins so that we could be adopted into his family. This is always the, the best and the most important news in the world. If you haven't yet put your trust in Jesus, then look to the stable. See the God who stoops. See what lengths he was prepared to go to in order to open up the gate of heaven. See what glory is revealed in the paradox of the high and lifted up God becoming a weak and powerless baby. Look to that Jesus and put your trust in him today. And if you already know this Jesus, then deliberately make some time this Christmas to meditate on this fact that we worship a God who stoops, a God who pursues us, even in the midst of our sin and rebellion, a God who loves to pour out his grace upon us. In, in the middle of all the craziness of commercial Christmas with all its tinsel and lights and gifts, deliberately pause and reflect on God's greatest gift, his son. Wonder again at the God who stoops. Whether you're feeling close to him or far away from him at the moment, remember that his attitude towards you is one of loving pursuit. Won't you run to him again this Christmas? And remember too how the New Testament highlights this servant-hearted, self-emptying, stooping of Jesus and then calls us to have the same attitude. To humbly consider others better than ourselves and not to look to our own interests but the interests of others. Why not make some time this Christmas to meditate on those verses in Philippians 2, 1-11 to and ask God to give you that same mind and heart as the God who stoops. There's much more that could be said, but our time is up. Let's pause and just have a, a moment of silence to reflect on what God has been saying to us this evening. Excuse me. We're going to finish our time by singing a lovely Christmas carol which focuses on the, this idea of God stooping. It celebrates that the one who is Lord of all, uh, yet he became a lowly infant for our sake. Infant holy, infant lowly. The musicians will lead us now as we close our service. Mm -hmm. 